<laughs> good afternoon. Wow, okay, the mic works. All right, uh, good to see everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to be talking with an esteemed panel of songwriters and creators assembled by ASCAP about the art and the business of songwriting. So, uh, they are so esteemed that I need a cheat sheet to read off who they are. So, in alphabetical order, we will start with Mr. Carter Burwell, one of the great, there you go. One of the great film composers of his generation or any generation, he has scored dozens of films, but I'll single out my favorites, which are nearly every single Coen Brothers movie, from Raising Arizona and Fargo to The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Uh, <laughs> Also, being John Malkovich, the Banshees of Inishirin, is that how you say it? Um, and Mildred Pierce, for which he won an Emmy. He has also been honored with ASCAP's prestigious Henry Mancini Award and nominated for Oscars and Golden Globes. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. You. Next up, Mr. Sam Hollander, songwriter and producer who has worked with One Direction, Panic at the Disco, Blink-182, Weezer, Katy Perry, Tyga, The OJs, Carol King, Ringo Starr, Niall Rogers, and some guy named Paul Williams. <laughs> He's had 11 number one singles on the Billboard Hot 100. He was also named to Variety's Hitmakers list. You're welcome. And was Billboard's top rock songwriter for nine weeks. Sam Hollander. Okay. Next up, Michael R. Jackson has won a Pulitzer Prize, the New York Drama Critics Circle Award, and 11 Tony nominations. He was one of Time Magazine's most influential people of 22, and I think most of these were for his work, A Strange Loop, which was described by the New York Times as a jubilantly anguished musical with infectious melodies. He Won a whole bunch of other awards, but you had me at Pulitzer. Michael R. Jackson. <laughs> All right. Next up, singer, songwriter, executive producer, Madison Amico Love is, I believe, the youngest person on this panel, or at least I think she's the only one of us who still qualifies for a 30 under 30 which she got from Forbes for this year. She's written for Selena Gomez, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Pink, Gwen Stefani, Halsey, Blackpink, Megan Thee Stallion, and more, and has a song on the Barbie soundtrack, which you might have heard about. Um, her songs have racked up more than 12 billion, billion streams. She also launched the Madison Love Future Fund to provide scholarship money for students in the Clive Davis Summer High School program. She also graduated from the Clive Davis program at NYU just a few years ago. Madison Amico Love. And finally, last alphabetically, but certainly not least, Greg Wattenberg, Grammy nominated songwriter, producer, musician who's written songs for Five for Fighting, John Legend, Noah Kahan, Daughtry, Train, including Hey Soul Sister, Rascal Flatts, Bon Jovi, Brad Paisley, and lots of others. Greg Wattenberg. All right, so the way that we're gonna do this is I'm gonna ask each panelist two or three questions just about how they got their start and things like that, and then we're gonna open up and everybody can raise their hand and answer uh, in any order they want. So I will start with you, Carter. How did you get your start? Um. Well, it was never a plan that I would be a, you know, a professional musician, honestly, but um, I was playing for fun, playing at clubs. This would be like in the 80s, CBGBs, places like that. And um, you know, so I guess in retrospect, I was getting my work out there, but at the time I was just having fun. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, someone I knew through that circle was, his day job was uh, doing sound mixing for films and TV. And he called me at some point and said, you know, these guys our age, they're making their first movie, they have no money, but, uh, you know, it's something about it feels like it might be, you know, the kind of music you write. I, even though I was playing at CBGB's, I would play instrumental music sometimes. Mm. Um, and uh, 
so he said, would that be interesting to you? And I said, sure, I'll, you know, sure. I basically say yes to everything. That was always, that was what I did back then. Um, so then I went and watched, uh, met these guys, and it was uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen, and it was their first film. And so um, <clears throat> they talked to a lot of other people. I didn't hear back from them for months. They were talking to, because the people who financed the film wanted them to hire someone who knew what they were doing, and that would definitely not be me. But um, in the end, they liked, I actually just went home and over the weekend wrote some things, gave them to them as a, as a demo. And um, in the end, they, they went with those. And that's basically what's in the movie. It's the stuff that I came up with like the day after I saw um, a reel. It is, it is almost comically serendipitous that like your first offer like that would be with the Coen brothers. Yeah, so I guess <laughs> it's not very instructive if, you're, if what you want to do is get into this business is how, does that, how is that story helpful? But, because people do ask me, and the only thing I can say that might be helpful is that don't wait at home for someone to call. Get your work out there. One of the great things about being a musician is you can do that. It's like, if you're an architect, you have to wait for someone to give you a million dollars to build something. But as a musician, you can play. You know, you go out and present yourself. And so, you know, I was at least doing that. And also, like, I was always just willing to say yes to anything. Well, that's, that's a big thing as well, being open to the opportunities, because you never know. Um, well, you answered the second question, which was going to be, what was your big break? So I'll ask, what's the biggest challenge you've overcome to get where you are? Um, well, um, <laughs> you know, there are, um, there's a million little challenges along the way which have to do with just, like, dealing with personalities and the, you know, caprices of the, of the business. But um, I think to get to where I am, the... Um, I've just been very fortunate to, again, I have good fortune, but to meet filmmakers who don't want to repeat themselves and don't want me to repeat myself. They're not mm -hmm. asking me to do the same thing that I did before. So that has allowed me to show that I can do lots of different things and to bring a, I think also, honestly, I think that my scores have a sensibility. It happens to match Joel and Ethan's very well. Mm -hmm. um, and you occasionally will find someone else out there like Martin McDonough or Spike Jones, who has a similar sensibility and we, and we mesh. And it's not like they can find like 100 other people to exactly do that. So I've managed to find, amazingly, this little, this little niche that represents you know, who I am through film. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's, it's worked out very nicely for your, for your discography. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, let me see. Sam, same questions for you. How did you get your start? And I gotta say, it is awesome the way your sneakers match the chair. I know you planned that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> um, I got my start, well, played JV football. <laughs> and I sucked. And <laughs> What happened was, you know, I thought I had, uh, I thought I had like Division three potential, but I had like Division ten potential. So I was cut from the football team, started a band, and I was tone deaf. There were a lot of things working against me. And, uh, you know, this is a, I'm sitting here next to Carter Burwell, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jackson. Like, these are very heavy cats. I'm less of a heavy cat. But one thing I am is tenacious. So I wanted to be a songwriter. I wanted to be a lyricist specifically. And I had no entryway into this business whatsoever. So I moved to the city at 18. I attended three colleges in two semesters. I know there isn't one person in this room who can say that. <laughs> say it. No, seriously. Did anybody here attend three colleges in two semesters? <laughs> I, I rest my case. How can you even do so, that? <laughs> I pounded the streets, and um, I, I started a band. It was a, a live hip-hop band. I got signed to Select Records in 1991. And uh, you never heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else I touched sort of had a, a, a similar ending for many, many years until it finally connected, and um, I hope that answered it. What was it that connected and made that big break? Well, you know what? I think the universe connected. I, I, I did, uh, I always felt that at least lyrically I had a, a specific voice. Um, and that was, you know, when Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours, I did 20,000 hours. I, uh, I, I wrote every day for 15 straight years and kept altering my craft. And as genres continued to shift and interweave, 
you know, I grew up listening to a lot of soul, a lot of disco, and a lot of hip hop, but I also understood punk rock, and I understood a lot of indie rock. And so I was able to fuse a lot of these influences in my writing, but music didn't really, what I was doing at the time, there was this fucker named Kurt Cobain, and this dick, eh? this guy, this guy like writes his own songs, you know what I mean? So they didn't really need me. So for many years, I waited for an opening where um, artists and bands were more collaborative. And I think we were discussing it earlier a little bit, iTunes, the advent of iTunes was huge for me because I think when bands started to see artists like, you know, Justin Timberlake or Britney or whoever was popping in like 2004, uh, dominating the iTunes single charts, I think bands started to realize, well, maybe songs could be more maybe crafted in, in a pop way. And because I, I grew up on all these forms of music, I was able to do that. And it was my time. Okay, then. What's the biggest challenge you faced along the way, or are facing now, for that matter? You see my face? <laughs> it's, been, it's been a battle since birth. <laughs> Jesus. Um, biggest battle to date, to be honest with you, is um, this mu the industry evolves specifically, you know, I feel like since I got into this industry in 1991, I lived through three or four industries over time, right, over five or 10 year intervals. And now I feel like it's shifting on a yearly basis at a speed that none of us can process. My manager said something to me last week as I was whining for the 4,000th time. And he said, you know, throw out everything you ever knew. Because you're existing in a state of anarchy in 2024. And that's the hardest thing for me because I am a traditionalist. I do believe in song, I believe in you know, um, for me, a great song can take four weeks to craft and get right. And we are in a time of speed dating and sessions and young writers are hungry and they're struggling because they're not getting paid enough. So they're out there and they'll do four sessions a day because they have to. And that is the biggest shift for me is getting used to that wiring because I'm a perfectionist. I want my, my, my stuff. I hear a craft, I hear a voice and we don't have the luxury of that sometimes now. I'll work with a writer and you know, I'll think, okay, let's get back in and harness what we did and they've already booked 45 sessions in a row afterwards because they're trying to eat and I don't blame them. But that's what, I think the biggest struggle is just constantly working within an evolving paradigm and understanding it. All right, we are definitely gonna come back to that issue in a little bit. Uh, Michael, how did you get your start? You're the only Broadway composer here on this panel. <laughs> Um, I mean, my start is like such a flight of fancy and like it doesn't, it's not a straight line at all because I had no designs or ambitions toward being a, a theater composer at all. I grew up wanting to be an actor. As a child, I did some child acting. I took piano lessons, I sang in choir, I did dance classes. I, did, I was just very involved in the arts, but um, I, sort of, I started off mostly as a, as a like fiction and poetry writer um, taking piano lessons, and I wanted to write songs, but I didn't understand song form. So I would just like improv improvise music on the piano because I learned how to play by ear, and I was playing in church and that sort of thing. And then once I, you know, I went to undergrad for playwriting, and then I went to the NYU Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program as an aspiring lyricist and book writer. And it was there, once I got a handle on, so on song form, that the musical impulses that had been with me since I was like uh, in high school and in middle school um, sort of suddenly had a place to go. And I began right, trying to, I was, happened to be given um, an assignment by one of my teachers who is a songwriter, Mike Reed, who wrote the song, I Can't Make You Love Me, yeah. on Spropani Rate. And he happened to just give an assignment one day to our class that said, if you're a lyricist who's never written music or a composer who's never written lyrics and you want to try it, go for it. And so I decided to give it a go. And I wrote a song for that class called Memory Song, which would subsequently make its way into my musical, A Strange Loop, which I hadn't even really started yet. And the song went over really well in my class. And then I was encouraged by Mike and my, uh, the chair of our department to continue writing music, even though for my thesis project, I was gonna be paired with composer for our second year project. And so I just started writing music on, my, on the side just for fun, and more and more people just 
kept encouraging me, and so I just kept doing it. And then I started putting that music into this monologue that I'd been writing um, that then would turn into this musical that I called, that was called A Strange Loop. And then 15 years <laughs> later after that, it went to uh, Off-Broadway at Playwrights Horizons, and then two years after that, it went to Broadway. So it was like a kind of crazy thing <laughs> that happened that I wasn't even trying to make happen. What was happening in those 15 years between, between finishing it and... Okay, so <laughs> I was ushering at the New Amsterdam Theater for five horrible years. I was working as a finance assistant at an advertising agency for another five horrible years. I was temping, I was in despair, I was bouncing rent checks, I was doing everything that you could imagine. <laughs> um, but I was also writing, you know, all the time, like, mm -hmm. while all of those things were happening. It's so glamorous. Wow, sorry, what was that noise? Um, what, how did that, how did it suddenly get, I mean, I guess that's the breakthrough question, or your big break question. How did it suddenly get picked up? I mean, if it had been around. So it was, it was kind of interesting because what happened was I had been working on the piece on and off for many years, doing various little workshops and readings and at music stands and all this stuff that you have to do as a, as a young theater writer. And then uh, the show, people just started to, the industry started to catch wind of the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a reading at Playwrights Horizons in 2016 after doing this big concert at Fine Science 54 Below. And there was a producer there uh, who really like responded to the show and she, but she wasn't thinking she would produce it, but she was mad that no one after seeing the reading, which went really, really well, she was mad that no one would do it. And then there was this other guy there named Mike Walkup who was an artistic director at a down, small downtown theater company who, whose mission statement was to help playwrights get their first off-Broadway productions. And so the two of them sort of found each other and was like, she was like the uptown Broadway commercial theater uh, producer. He was the downtown um, nonprofit theater producer. And so they decided to band together. She optioned the musical. And then we did some more work on it. And then we did another industry reading like nine months later. And then that was when Player to Horizons, with her behind it, because when you're doing musicals at nonprofit theaters, you kind of have to have enhancement money mm -hmm. to do it because the musicals are so expensive. And so she, you know, and they, they felt it was finally ready to be produced. So then it, that was what led to that initial off-Broadway production. And then the show just was like, really was a big hit um, off-Broadway. And um, people, and that's when, you know, my producer pro approached me to see if I wanted to make a go of trying to get on Broadway, which is very difficult because Broadway, for all of the glamour and glitz of it, is actually just about real estate mobsters. Um, <laughs> you know, and you like doing back deals with them to try to get a theater, because there's only 41 Broadway theaters and there's like millions of people with a dream in their heart of doing a musical trying to get in there. Mm. And so we were fortunate that we'd had a lot of good buzz around the show, but then of course the great plague of 2020 came and put everybody's dreams on ice. But then two months, but then two months into the, the plague, um, I incomprehensibly won a Pulitzer Prize <laughs> for A Strange Loop, um, which gave the piece a lot of heat again. Right. And so that was sort of helped us once we were getting back to performing again. Um, and we did an out-of-town tryout in D.C., and then we got a theater that, that winter, and then we were on Broadway by that spring. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because there's serendipity in that story as well, but it took 15 years of constant effort to make that happen. Um, a, that was a lot of challenges in there. What's oh, the, yeah. yeah. What's the biggest one you're facing now, apart from trying to follow up a Pulitzer Prize-winning play? Well, I did <laughs> follow up with a show called White Girl in Danger, 
Um, and I have a current show that's running, that's about, that started previews last week, and it's running again at Playwrights Horizons called Teeth, that I'm writing with a composer collaborator this time. And I guess, like, for me, honestly, you know, the biggest challenge I personally feel is that the world, because of, like, social media and the internet and the world has really shifted in, in, in its sort of appreciation for mass art forms. And, like, we don't really live in a monoculture anymore, which in many ways is a positive because it means there's more opportunities for more people to do their work, but then there's other problems that come from that because it means that we don't always appreciate art, the art forms as a society together in the same way. And so, like, there's just so many niche interests, in form, and so it makes it harder for me as a theater writer, which is inherently about mass people all experiencing the same thing in one place, yeah. it makes it harder to, like, communicate ideas and to get people to appreciate um, what you're doing sort of formally um, in terms of form and content mm -hmm. and, and keep them sort of paying attention unless, like, you just happen to, you know, you know hit pay dirt and, like, and everybody likes what you're doing and, and they come and they want to see it. And it's just things are so expensive. Theater is so expensive. Everybody hates everybody. It's just like, so you have to like deal with all of that bullshit and while just trying to serve yourself artistically. Um, but, but, but there's all these niche interests that want different things. That for me is hard. Yeah, and then somebody does exactly what you're talking about and makes it look easy and you're just like, right. wow, yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, Madison, how did you get your start? Clive Davis School? Oh, so I started from heartbreak. I started taking guitar lessons, and my mom said, why don't you start journaling? Uh, see if any of this heartbreak, you could turn it maybe into a poem or a song. And I was like, okay. So I uh, started journaling, started writing lyrics to different chord progressions that I was learning every week in guitar lessons, and I would go up kind of like Taylor Swift style, and I would sing at town meeting at high school, and I'd sing the song live every week, every Monday morning, I would sing about the drama that I was going through. I got, yeah, I was like, why not? Let's just go for it. And yeah, I just kept writing songs. They were not great at the beginning, and you have to write hundreds and thousands of songs until you you know, write great material, but I applied to the Clive Davis program at NYU, Tisch, and I said, if I'm not gonna get in there, I'm not gonna go anywhere else, I'm gonna keep applying until I get into this specific program, because I was just so into learning about the industry and learning about publishing and, and songwriting, and I wanted to be an artist, so I wanted to be the best artist I could be. And I got an early admission to that program, which was the best day of my life. And I went in as an artist, came out as a songwriter. I think it came easier to me to write for other people. And I could do different things every day. I could write for different projects all the time. And it became a business for me. Um, I signed a publishing deal pretty early in college because one of my teachers was like, I love your homework. Great, great song you wrote for class. And he worked for a publishing company. And I was like, publishing, you know. My dad, I remember, he, they sent me a, a publishing deal, which I didn't know what that was. And I called my dad and I was like, I need a lawyer. And he was like, what did you do? He was so <laughs> mad. And I go, no, 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 I'm not in trouble. I got a publishing deal. And he goes, publishing? What, do you want to write books? What are you talking about publishing? And I told him, I, I've been writing these songs, and one of these A&Rs likes one of my songs for this DJ. I don't know what was going on. And so that I didn't end up signing that deal, but I got a lawyer, and then that was the next step. And he was like, this is not a good deal. Maybe we should shop you around. And that's kind of how I met my publisher. I was still in college when I signed. Um, I had a number one song before I graduated college. Which was cool. <laughs> wow. 
But yeah, just a lot of hustling. I was demo singing for Greg back in the day, trying to get in the room with big producers, just trying to make connections. And it's all about trying to hustle and, and work with the kids in your class. And I just really, I took it seriously. I was like, I want to leave this program and I want to have a life for myself. And I just, I just didn't give up and I just kept hustling. No, the determination goes a long way. What was the song? Uh, Bad Things by Machine Gun Kelly and yeah. Camila Cabello. Excellent. Um, well, there was, that there was your... All right. <laughs> that there was your big break. What's the biggest challenge you faced or are facing as a songwriter? I mean, every day you try and come in with a better song than you wrote the day before, so that's always a challenge. You always want to be trying to beat your songs. And, and when you give a song to another artist, you're like, oh, I gave that song away, but how am I going to write a better one? And you always have to stay creative. And that's something that I, I definitely work towards and always try and beat the songs every day, a better song. Uh, so that's challenging. And it's hard to get on, on albums. It's hard to get in the room with artists. It's hard to pitch songs to artists. You have to really... Um, hustle and get in the room and take meetings with A&Rs and see what they're looking for. And I remember getting tracks from A&Rs and writing six different lyric top lines and melodies over one track with different titles, different concepts, and saying, okay, do you like any of these six songs on your track? And some, I, I don't think I placed anything that way, but they were like, this girl wants to win. <laughs> so we want to help you. And so they would set me up with baby producers and then you just work your way up. It takes one song, you know, you just need one hit record, one record, one thing with someone, to, and then you can just work, you know, you can work forever, and that's what I believe. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. <laughs> the, cool thing, the cool thing is Madison was demo singing at our studio, and we were like, yeah, she's good. She's not there yet, but she's good. Like, there's something happening here. And then she went back to LA, that's where she's from. And then like our A&R guys were like, remember that, that girl Madison? I go, yeah, she go, hey, she's got a number one song. And I go, oh, yeah, that's how it happens. You basically are sort of dancing around being really good, and then you write the thousand songs. And, and you were, the, you're you're really, really, like, you're really like, why didn't we sign her? <laughs> <laughs> no, we were, I mean, we were, we were genuinely, gen, genuinely happy for her. I mean, we have a lot of writers who come through who, you know, you just want to be around talented people. I, I believe good things happen when you do that. So, so we work together now, and, and we, you know, so it's, it's, all, it's all good. And uh, I was thinking about this question of, you know, how you get started, and I was thinking about the time, and thinking about how do you keep it brief, because these stories can, you know, there's a lot to these stories, but the, 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 the one thing I'll say that um, was really funny for me, I was a musician since I was a little kid, you know, trumpet in the school band, playing Rocky and all that, all that shit. <laughs> and then... And then I go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a rock star. And I, and I get a record deal very young, and I get signed to one of the major labels, make a record, doesn't go. And this is, a, this is one of those great record industry stories. The, the label's telling us they're going to drop us. And the president of the label is like, you know, boys, it didn't work out. And, da, da, da. and I, he had, like, the perfect British accent, too, for this. And the singer of my band, who was a total hothead, screams in the middle of the room. I mean, I, I loved it at the moment. He goes... You're totally fucking us. You're t and he's top of his lungs. And I kind of gave him credit. And the record company president, older guy, goes, let me tell you something, boys. I've seen a lot of fuckings, and you're getting an average fucking. <laughs> 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 and I thought, and I thought, I don't think I want to be an artist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I said, I'll be a songwriter and a producer. Starved for 10 years. And... The fake it till you make it. I tell a lot of young writers and producers, you got to fake it till you make it a little bit. So what, what does that mean? Have a really strong opinion. Because in a music industry of nobody knows anything, the strongest opinion wins in a lot of rooms. I'm talking at the highest level rooms. So how do you have a strong opinion? Well, know all the greatest songs ever written and refer to them in your mind and when you're talking to people and have a great database. So I was starving. I wanted to produce artists. They didn't want me to produce them because who the hell are you? And I got a job. This is the greatest fake it of all time. I get a job as the receptionist at Island Records. And I called those same artists and they said, you know, what are you doing? Like, stop bothering us. I go, I'm at Island Records. <laughs> 
And they were like, fuck, we got to get in the studio with this guy. <laughs> and uh, I went in, yeah, and, and I went in the studio and I was, I faked my opinion. I mean, I had an opinion, but I said it very confidently. Um, and they listened and they got a record deal. And, and then basically some people in that camp hired me to do another record. And then the, the second record I did was, you know, it was a number one song and a platinum record. This band, Five for Fighting, had a song called Superman. It was a, you know, it was a big song, you know, now 20 years old, but it, it's still on the radio, which is cool. And that's, that's how it happens. So I tell people, fake it, be really confident, even if you gotta fake the confidence. And, and to Madison's point, just keep doing it because, you know, nobody wakes up a naturally great anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, putting the hours in really is, is everything. And the hardest thing, challenge, forget AI, forget all that shit, because that's depressing. But the hardest thing that I would say is, it's funny, as I'm hearing everyone talk, is being in a room with a new artist, as I get older, and that person has had no hits, the hardest thing is trying my best to not say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I've had way more hit songs than you. I know what I'm doing. You can never say that, but you'll want to say it to make people do it. So that, that's, you know, it, it, I know it's a little bit funny, but it really is hard sometimes because you, when you do it a long time, you, you start to figure things out. And, uh, but we can talk about the other real challenges of the music industry too. Well, all right. Um, you know, why don't we start? Well, let's see. We've got 13 minutes. Um, songwriting's a business. What advice would you give to people who are not necessarily starting off, but maybe not at the level that you're in? I mean, both things that, like, they should have already done and things that they can do, just things to watch out for. Madison? <laughs> things to watch out for? Things to watch out for? Yeah. You're talking about songwriters who are sort of mid-career mid path. Yes. I mean, I would say when, when I was starting out, too, I was always saying yes to everything. Like, they're like, work with this writer who I was like, I don't know about <laughs> that. But I always said yes. I was like, you never know what you're going to write today. You never know what your mom's going to say to you before the session that's going to inspire whatever you're about to do. Or if that artist ends up not showing up, what song you're going to write. And I've had a lot of crazy experiences with that. So I would say, I was always saying yes to opportunities. Mm -hmm. Collaborating is key. Yeah, collaborating. Yeah. yeah, I'd also say like market research is a thing, you know what I mean? Like word of mouth is a massive aspect of this business and truthfully, you're as good as the work you put into it. Everybody talks. Everybody's in the mix with everybody. Names suddenly start appearing out of nowhere where you're like, you're talking about Madison, like hey man, she's really good, she's very talented, very talented. You're going to see that more and more. Just put yourself in those positions. When you get in a position, you're writing with somebody who's maybe in a camp with somebody that you want to work with, that's the day you show up and you just absolutely destroy because that they're going to remember it. And the more word of mouth gets out about you, amazing things will happen. I really believe that. Something that's really cool that's happening right now is there are artists that, that our company's looking at that are not even, they're just songwriters in their basement, or hopefully something nicer than their basement, put using AI, creating avatars, creating songs that there's no artist. Mm -hmm. that, it, it's, they're the artist. And they're putting it out as an artist project. They own it 100%, the master and the publishing. And there's one artist right now I'm looking at, they, they cleverly took the game Sims, the video game Sims, created a girl group using Sims, you know, avatar creator, and put it out as if it was a girl group, and it's doing about 40 million streams on this one song, and they're keeping all of it, and I'm going, this is the new day we're in. That's where AI is kinda gonna be cool, because that person is just a songwriter. Mm -hmm. That person isn't an artist. I don't even know if they're singing the songs. And, and, and they're, not, you know, they're not in concert, but I think that's a way songwriters are gonna empower themselves. I think there's some cool stuff where I think if you're a songwriter and you always wanted to put out a song as an artist, you could have an artist project now. Mm -hmm. Do you, as songwriters, as composers, feel threatened by AI? Because the, the way that I see it is, number one, the labels at the major music companies do seem to be doing their best to control it as much as you can at this point, because it's obviously in their self-interest to do it. 
But I would actually see the threat coming more for people who are writing jingles, people who are writing songs for banks and stuff like that. Because if, if you're a business person, does it make more sense to pay a band and songwriters, yeah. or does it make more sense to pay someone who's just going to plug in some AI and make it that way? <laughs> well, I mean, I agree. I think that mm -hmm. the, the I don't personally feel threatened, but um, I do think that a lot of like what what in my business would be entry level positions. Uh, where like maybe you're working at some place like Hans Zimmer has, and he writes themes, and you're like you know f fleshing it out, writing cues. A lot of those jobs I think are going to disappear because you can simply get more. Not, it's not even about the money; these people don't even necessarily get paid very well. You can t get ten more options in, in less time with the, with AI. AI is not there yet, but I think if you're talking about like in a year, I think that um, there's a whole there are a whole bunch of those types of jobs that are, you know, you can say they're going to disappear or they're just going to hopefully transmute into, your, these people are going to learn how to operate the AI systems, to learn how to prompt them. And, and having a musical sensibility, I think, will be important. And, but it's not going to be writing music. It's just going to, it's going to be a different thing. I hope the, there will still be jobs. But I think a lot of what currently are composing jobs will, I think, disappear. Mm -hmm. Do you have to evolve? I Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Michael. I, I've been having these conversations with friends and people for, you know, the last year. Yeah. Uh, and I feel very confused. I feel like both scared and skeptical of AI at the same time, particularly as it comes to things like music, because to be very candid with you, a lot of the, there's a lot of music that I hear now that to me sounds like it is what, <laughs> like it's AI. So, like, when I hear something that is actually AI, <laughs> and it doesn't sound like there's no difference to me, I'm just sort of like, well, what, who's actually, the audience for it is, is already there, no matter what you do. Right. So then what's the real distinction we're making other than, like, it's just cheaper to make the thing that you already are getting from artists? So the thing I'm just always thinking about is how, like, is there any way for um, people in the music industry, and I'm not, you know, I'm not in the pop world, I come at it from musical theater, but like to, to re-incentivize really great music that is actually not AI-able, like in a sense, like that, it's, that, it is, that it actually has a soul to it that is not uh, of okay. interest to AI to replicate. And to, and to take that into the real world, into live performances, in, into the, the, the sort of places where you do listen to music at a concert or something, to make it popular again. But that goes back to my thinking about the sort of shattering of the monoculture, and I don't know I, yeah, I think that, that will ever come back to that, but that's just where I've, I'm, always, I'm always grappling with that. Yeah, I, I do agree with what you said, Jim. The low hanging fruit music is in trouble. I think if you're making music for background music, for spas, reality TV, libraries, your elevator, whatever it is, you're probably in trouble just because a lot of people aren't really going to fight for that so much. I think mm -hmm. AI can replicate that. I think to Michael's point, you know, yeah, a great lyric, a great singer, something you've, what music is, what it can do, it can touch you in a, in a sort of meaningful way that undefinable thing that we all try to get in a room and make, that's gonna be hard to recreate. But it is scary, you have to agree that where AI was a year ago and where it is today tells you that you could theoretically feed into AI the most soulful song, the most elaborate, sophisticated musical thing, and it could spit some, if it has enough information, it theoretically could do it. So I don't know where it ends up, but today, it feels to me like, yeah, I wouldn't get into making music that's low-level music. I think um, what I do excite, I am excited about is when, I, when, when sampling and, and sample libraries started to come to exist, everyone was worried like, oh, you're going to put orchestras out of business and you're going to put drummers out of business because you can do it in your computer. I think it's just going to be a tool like that was. It's just going to be a thing people are going to use to create a vocal, to create a groove, to create a track, and they'll use it as a tool no different than use a sample. There are things out there that already, you could argue, have put people out of work, but it created more opportunities also at the same time. So um, I think it's, it's a little scary where it's going, but it feels like for the next stretch, it's just gonna be a tool that should also, help. 
this, I think there's going to be a reaction against it as well, though. You know, I mean, I think that there will be some sort of revolution that counters it, where I think that, that a lot of people will take like a very organic path, and maybe sort of jumping on what Mike was saying, maybe things will take. You know, there are different. It, it, there's no monoculture, right? We're talking about like there's just there's all this other stuff. There's all this stuff happening. There's going to be all these people who go run from it and you know do make create incredible music that has nothing to do with it. And there's going to be people who embrace it and use it like samplers in the early days and stuff. And you know, and there's going to be people who like purposely like like the way there's like m was like mumblecore. There's going to be like AI cringe. Yes. Like there's going to be like AI cringe music yes. that people do on purpose. Yes. And that'll be like its own whole subgenre, but like, I. By the way, if you want to make an AI cringe <laughs> record, let's go. But like, but like, part, again, like I, this thing with AI, like why I get so confused by it is like it's also about making everything sound perfect, and a lot of the music that you love the most actually doesn't sound perfect at all, right. and that part of right. the soul of it are the imperfections. That was something the choir teacher once said to me when I was in high school that stayed with me all these years. He said, sometimes the flaws are what make it. Mm -hmm. and, I, yep. and so part of, maybe part of what you're describing is an aspect of that, that like, there, there's gonna be, like, if you inundate the, the world with all this AI sound, at a certain point, people are gonna actually become quite bored with it, oh. because you won't be able to improve upon it in any way, because it's only, capable of making copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, and it can't recalibrate for the intangible, soulful thing that, that is the element of music that touches people. Unless, of course, what is going to happen is that everyone does become AI themselves, <laughs> and the only thing that they will respond to are the things that are perfect and, like, don't have a soul. That could happen, and then we're all fucked. But <laughs> I think that that will actually take a lot longer. Yeah. To, like, kill the entire human spirit. Yeah, no, I was interviewing Mark Ronson once, and he said he'd done a session with Adele, and she did 19 takes of just one passage trying to get the crack in her voice right. Yeah. And, like, when that happens, when AI can do that, and when it can come up with a melody that'll make me cry, then I feel like we're in trouble. Or, like, think that's, about that's all, all the content that's, like, online already. People, like, how many times on your Instagram have you seen some video of them, like, look at this video of Whitney Houston singing without yep. Yep. The, the backing track and, like, the sound of her voice. That's not, like, that's, like, that's Whitney. Yeah. Like, that's, like, not, you can't recreate that. What are the best places for songwriters and creators to get advice and information, especially if they're not in LA or Nashville and in a place where, you know, where there aren't other professional songwriters to get advice from? I mean, I think you can always, like, one you know, thing that's good about the digital hellscape that we're in is that you can at least reach out to people through social media, email. Like, and I find that like, a lot of artists are very willing to communicate with people and, and to get advice. And there's online workshops and panels and Zooms and all these things that, that I think make it easier to access information from, from person to person. I mean, look, ASCAP's doing this. This is awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're all here, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. ASCAP. Thank you. ASCAP. Thank you. Um, you know, there, there is more information than we ever had. When we came up, we knew nothing. There was nothing. You were on the streets. You are just figuring it out. Um, you know, the podcasts are great. The, the, what's the Ari guy, Ari's take on music? That guy's on top of it. He seems to understand yeah. where the industry's moving. I think he does Sorry, a great who job. Who is it? Say his name. Ari, what is it? Ari's... Ari Let's go with it. Yeah. Ari Herstad. The guy's on top of it. And I really, I, you know, my daughter's an aspiring writer. And I, I, I think, send her to his stuff. I actually think TikTok is good for a lot of stuff yeah. like this. I think there's a lot of people on there who well. are dissecting what makes great songs work. What, what about that? You know, the that, master classes are pretty interesting. Yeah, master like, classes. You just have, you have so much stuff at your disposal. If you put the work into it, you're certainly gonna, you're gonna learn more than we ever had the chance to. Yeah. Okay. If you can't get help, just DM Sam up here. He'll take <laughs> all, you your, all your questions after this. Okay, we're being asked life. to wrap up, wrap up, so I got one more question, and that's, are there, or, uh, amazingly, there is no songwriters union, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a publisher's union, essentially a union, you know, trade groups, things like that. What are some organizations you feel are doing a good job of advocating for songwriters and, Things that people can join to make a difference and help themselves. I think ASCAP actually is starting to really break through. I think they had a record year this year. ASCAP has 
all the heft that Universal Music has. They represent half the songwriters, basically, mm -hmm. the whole US market. So they're able to push around some of the players who are paying us, and that's starting to move the needle. I think the songwriters have to demand a little more of themselves. Artists are starting to do that. Artists are saying to record companies, sorry, I'm not taking an 18% royalty. Fuck off, I want a 50-50 deal, and this is why. And, and they, they have to do a little DIY to get there. Yep. Songwriters gotta start doing that themselves. I, I always said I hated that there was always a songwriter or a producer standing behind another songwriter saying, oh, I'll do it for free. Yep. That's not good. Yep. So you, you, gotta, you gotta sort of stand up for what you do and say, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not also, taking that deal. And to build on that, writers also, for anybody out there who's accomplished certain things, it's also our job as well to advocate for everybody else out there. And I think it's important yeah. because there are a lot of upper tier writers who remain completely silent and aren't out there in the struggle and the fight. And I think it's essential. So those are the people to DM and drive down. And I also, yeah. this is sort of tang a little bit tangent to that, but I also think that like there's music education and teaching kids about a lot of these issues so that they like, it's normal to them to think about this kind of advocacy and that music is important enough to stand up for and artists. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, well there we have it. We are wrapping up. All right. Thank you to these great panelists and thank you to ASCAP. <laughs>